Amen and amen. Praise God in the Lamb. Somebody came to have church. It's good to see you today, this little rainy morning. I know there's a great temptation when you wake up on a Sunday morning and it's cloudy and misty to have that famous battle with the blanket. I'm glad you overcame and you won it. I didn't. Kathy had to make me get up. So. <laughs> Not really. I made it alive. Praise the Lord. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights, we've been dealing with this topic about reconnecting with God. And Sunday morning, I spoke about this topic last Sunday. And today I will do the same. We'll close this series with this message today. But certainly, hopefully, not close the concept text and the concept that we're connecting with the Lord in the way that He wants us to do. I told you when I first started this series that I didn't necessarily like the title, but I'd already done all the artwork and everything. So didn't want to change it after that. The idea is that we are, we are connected already with God. There's no way in the world, I firmly believe, the Bible teaches that, you know, that once we know Him, we are in the family of God. <clears throat> and He's not like an earthly father who might perhaps disinherit you. He's, he's, a, he's a righteous father, bound by covenants and oaths and promises, all right, that He has placed upon Himself and invited us to come in and be part of His family. So we get connected with Him. We become one in Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible says your life is hid with Christ in God. I mean, that's where you are. You're in securely connected, alive with Him. But I do believe that we can lose our fellowship and the joy of our fellowship and the joy of that relationship, even though the relationship is still there. And so the context of these messages has really been twofold. One, as individuals, how do we get back to that place of walking in revival? And two, just the overall idea of awakening and the overall idea of, uh, of revival uh, in our church, in our community, in our nation, ultimately. That God would move in such a way as He's done in, in years past, where we, we've seen great moves of God, great moves of the Spirit of God through the Great Awakenings, the First Awakening, the Awakening of the 1800s, 1700s, even as, as lately as the 70s when we saw a real move of the Spirit of God through the Jesus Movement. But we have yet to see God do the kind of things He's done in days gone by. And my prayer and our prayer ought to be that God revive us again, that we could walk with you and see you move on those extraordinary levels that we have seen you move or desire to see you move. I believe God wants to do something great in our hearts and lives. We've been taking this message through almost like a, a series and a process of the way God works and the way God moves in our life. And I want to continue with that as we, as we dealt with uh, for the last couple of weeks and from Wednesday night into Sunday morning, we dealt with this issue of humility and honesty and then repentance. Because that's really the, 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 the process I believe that God takes everyone through. It first of all begins with humility. Am I willing to be open, sensitive, honest uh, with God? You know, can I get to the point where I just realize how unable and incapable I am on my own to do anything for the glory of God, that I need God. I can't overcome in this life. I can't have victory in this life. I can't do what I need to do in this life. I can't even be a good pastor, a good husband, a good father without God. And we get back to that place of our total dependence. We realize I need God. But it just doesn't come with a revelation that I need God. Because a lot of people come to that place, say, amen, well, I need God. But then they don't do much about it. So that brings us to that next process, step in the process of honesty. Jesus said, if you worship me, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. Now that means that we're open for examination. That means that we're being really genuinely sincere before God and saying, God, uh, you show me what's in my heart. I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to seek to defend myself. I'm not even going to try to justify myself. I just want to get it right. Which brings us to the place of repentance. Which, once we understand, I'm going to say a word about repentance in just a moment, but once we get a grip on what real repentance is, then it's amazing how God works. And I really do believe we see that miraculous intervention of the Spirit of God in our lives. It is so miraculous and it is so unique that we don't even realize it. And it's so subtle the way God does this. But literally, He extends His grace upon us. And I want to talk about grace in, the, in, the, in a kind of a context that a lot of people perhaps haven't really listened or heard about grace and what it can do in your life. The Bible says this in James 4, and here's the, the stepping stones once again. James 4 says, He gives a greater grace. Isn't that good news? Amen. Greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than anything. Therefore, it says that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So we humble ourselves and realize that God has grace for us. And we, we get our hearts right with God. We get transparent with God, which brings us to that place that we said of, of repenting before the Lord. And we, talk, and we talked about this on, on a, in our service where I said that uh, real repentance begins with a change of thinking. In fact, the Greek word is metanoia, which means to change the way you think. 
But it's not just, you know, an opinion. But it really has to do with your core beliefs and what you really think, what really goes on in life. There's a lot of people who, who don't understand the context of repentance. They think it's just trying harder or, or doing better. But it really starts with your perception, your perception of God, perception of uh, His Word, your perception of His will, His purposes for your life. You, you begin to realize that the Bible's true, that God's ways are the right ways. I mean, everything begins to be adjusted. And because you have a change of thinking, repentance is a change of thinking that produces or is accompanied by a turning. It's kind of like two sides of a coin. It's the same coin, but yet there's two different elements to it. One is, I begin to think differently about my life, my God, the Lord Jesus, the world around me, my sin, just a whole new perspective. But not only am I thinking differently now, it is a thinking that produces a, a change in my life. It produces a turning in my life. It's, it's, it's that point where you come to where you realize that not only am I thinking right, all right, now my behavior needs to line up with my beliefs and what I really think. In fact, you may not realize it, you do really act on your beliefs. Uh, now, the problem is we know that as Christians we can become unbelieving believers. We can be believers who believe the Word of God and believe what the Bible says and thank God for what He's done, but yet we're not walking in faith. We're not walking in an attitude of trusting God. We're not obeying God. We're not submitting to God. We're, we're disconnected, as I say. There's no real passion. There's no fires burning. There's no unction, you know, unction no, no function. It was just, we're stagnant in our spiritual life, even though... We're going to all the meetings, even though we're going through all the routine, even though we're exercising all the daily efforts that we would normally do so. But I want you to know we, we, we're just not really believing God. Real repentance is a change of thinking that results in a change of our behavior. In fact, the old English word for belief comes from the concept of behavior. In other words, I behave as I believe. Now, if I'm really walking with God in faith, guess what I'm doing? My behavior lines up with the Word of God. My life lines up with the Word of God. So this is repentance. Now, this is where some people miss it at this point, you know, and this whole idea of what repentance is. Where does, where does God intervene? Because some people are just waiting for God to do something, you know, and it's like, you know, they, they just haven't got to that place. I believe God intervenes at the place of repenting. It's where a movement of grace really comes in our life. I, I, I quoted this last week, but let me quote it again. I think Wednesday night is, and Thomas Watson, a Puritan, said, would, would you know when you have been humbled enough from your sin, for your sin? Here's the answer when you're willing to let go of your sin. When you're willing to let go. When you're willing to embrace God's will. Uh, you know, have you ever had a problem with your wanter? Now, my brother used to witness to me a lot before I met the Lord. For about a year, he was always trying to insert some witness and get to me or talk to me. But one of the things he, he said to me in those early days of, of witnessing to me before I came to Christ was, you know, he said, you know, I, I, my, one of my excuses was I just don't want to do it and then not succeed. I, you know, I, I can't live that way. That's not who I am. You know, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. All those things that people say. The problem was, you know, that I, I, there was no passion, no power, no desire to do the will of God. All right? But he made this statement to me. He says, you know, when you give your life to Jesus, God changes your wanter. <laughs> he changes your want-tos. And whereas you didn't want to, now you want to. And I didn't completely understand that at the time because that really maintained, I maintained that, that uh, facade of saying, I'm not going to give my life to Jesus because, well, I don't want to fail. And, and some of you are like that today. I mean, maybe it's not giving your life to Jesus. Maybe it's going on with the Lord, going deeper with Christ. You say, well, I just kind of, I want to stay right here because, you know, I don't risk anything and I don't want to fail at anything. Well, you're already failing if that's where you are, all right? So you haven't got anything to lose at this point. You know, the, the want to is the big issue. Don't you wish you had one of those buttons on your kids that was a want to button? You know, when you, say, when you say to your daughter, go clean your room, you know, you just push the button and she'd want to. <laughs> take out the trash, son. Push the button. He wants to take out the trash. Uh, well, there's no button in reality, all right, that we can, we can push and change our want to -ers, But I do believe that God can do something in our life that changes our want to -ers that he can do a work in our life. Now, if we could come up with a button like that for Christians, we could probably make a lot of money off of it. But God has done something already in our life by placing in us his Holy Spirit, but even more so by putting in us what the Bible describes as grace. And a lot of us just don't understand the context or the concept. And I hope this morning is simply to lay it out before you, you know, because, you know, even over the last weeks as we've talked about this subject, and some of you have followed with me in this, you, you've really been seriously thinking about this. You've made the Wednesday night services. You, you're showing some, some, uh, some enthusiasm in regard, I really want God to do something in my life. I'm, I, I don't want to be stalemated. I, I want to have a revival in my, in my passion for Christ and my desires for Christ. And so the Lord's been working in your heart, perhaps, and, and maybe through all that, you know, you, you've, uh, you've been having a great deal of problem 
facing that because you're, you're saying, well, maybe the desire's not really there, or I, may, I just don't have the power to, to see those changes in my life. In fact, let me give you a little evaluation, a few evaluation questions, and, and, and tell me if any of these statements are true about you. The first is this, I am strongly tempted to sin. Oh, you bunch of liars. <laughs> Amen. Maybe you're in a place right now where you're me more strongly than you have been before in your life. You're not, you say, these just seem overwhelming, overcoming temptations. Or, uh, I, am given, I give in to temptation and I choose to sin. Maybe this third one, I feel overpowered by the pull of a particular sin in my life. Like there's this strong amount, it, it keeps appealing and, and pulling on me. And it just keeps drawing me. So, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with that issue in my life. Maybe you're saying, I know what God wants me to do, but I just don't have the desire to obey Him. It's just not in my life. Or I really do want to obey God, but I don't seem to have the power. There's the desire, but I just don't seem to have the power to do so in my life. Or maybe I just feel totally inadequate to do what God's asking me to do. I know what He wants me to do. I just don't seem to have the, it feel adequate at all. So what do I need in my life? Where, where's the answer to these dilemmas and, and facing these particular struggles that I'm facing right now? What, what, what is it? Well, let me tell you what you need today. And more than anything, this is what you need. You need grace. You need grace. And I, I, as I said before, I believe this is a misunderstood term. Often we think of grace simply in, a, in a, probably in the most beginning phases of what grace really is, is how God deals with us in salvation. He opens our eyes of understanding. He convicts us of our sin. He reveals to us that his, his plan of salvation through his son Jesus, that he, he's died for our sins. And when we didn't deserve it, and we in no way merited God's gracious work of Jesus being sent to die on the cross for us, you know, he did that anyway. And, and we realize that it, God is working us, and we see the cross, and we understand grace just kind of in that little venue and in that little window and we realize that it's grace that gave us the, the faith to really trust in Christ. It was grace that delivered us from sin and brought us into a right and a, and a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And we got that part of it. In fact, this is the way the Apostle Paul writes it. He said, but God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places of Christ, in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. In other words, if you say, I'm saved, you, all you can say is that God did this for me. Amen. God touched my life. God changed my heart. God saved me from my sins. God did a work in me. I'm saved because of the grace of God. But we need to understand that grace even goes a little bit beyond that, all right? When Paul said he, he showed us the immeasur immeasurable riches of his grace and, and, and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Not only did he show it to us when he saved us, God wants to give us grace for each day of our life. Grace to deal, grace to walk, grace to live, grace to parent. Grace to be a husband. Grace to be a wife properly. Grace to be what God's called you to be in your life. See, God's grace is a supernatural supply for everything that you lack. It's God giving you everything you need. And grace plays a far greater role in our life than just in our initial salvation. It's that power. It's that way in which God demonstrates uh, His fruit and His, His power through our lives. It's what gives us fruitful living and helps us overcome sin on a daily basis. It's not because I have a strong willpower. It's because I have a strong God. And He gives me His grace. The Bible says God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you have sufficiency, all sufficiency, in all things, at all times. So you may abound in every good work. That's good to know. Not only grace for salvation. Now, the context of that verse is unique because he's talking about in, 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 in the, to the Corinthians about their giving and their finances. And boy, this is where a lot of people need grace because they look at their finances and they say, oh, I just can't do what God wants me to do. You don't understand grace. You don't understand God wants to miraculously do something in your life. And when you will humble yourselves, get honest with him, and then obey him with a repentant heart, God gives us grace so that you have all things. But this is, goes beyond just our finances. What about that relationship? What about that situation? What about that difficult person? What about the job you're on? God gives grace. He's able to make all grace abound toward you. You have all sufficiency in all things. 
So that not only your needs are met. He said, so you can move out and be a part of something even greater in meeting other people's lives and needs. Hebrews 4 says, let us then draw with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace. Why? So we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You need help? You have a need? Grace is the answer by which God is going to give you what you need. Then it says again in Romans 6, 14, Sin has no dominion and will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but you are under grace. Now, here's the thing about it. We think of that in, this, in the context of our salvation, don't we? All right, I'm not going to go to hell because God's supplied grace. But it also means you don't have to live in hell. God supplies grace. He says, now that you are saved, sin's not your master anymore. You don't have to do what your flesh dictates. You don't have to do what the world dictates. You don't even have to do what some circumstances might be seeming to dictate. People say, you just don't know the situation. As I just had to. No. You're under grace, not under law. You're not bound to those things anymore. There's freedom in your life because of the grace of God. Grace is this, that dynamic quality of God that gives us the desire and the power to obey Him. Simply put, you call it quality, you can call it anointing, you can call it the Spirit's action in our life, but whatever it is, it's God giving us the desire and the power to obey Him. So if you're sitting there today, and you're realizing you're not where God wants you to be, and you're starting to experience this desire, that's God starting to work in you. And as much as God is faithful like that, to give you this desire to do as well, He also wants to give you the power to obey Him. So you need grace. How does it work? I mean, how does it all come together? Let's well, start the very simplest principle one. What does God want for your life? What's God's purpose for your life? Well, God's purpose for my life is to conform me to the image of His Son to restore me back to the original design, all right? The designer's specifications. To make, to make us like Christ so that we can walk with God and know God in, in, his, in his fullness so we can experience God in his will and his purpose so we can have fellowship with God. In fact, the word Christian means little Christ. And the work of God in our life is a grace work and it's his spirit through his church, through his word, rebuilding us in His image, applying all these elements of the Holy Spirit's work in our life to make us more like Jesus, preparing us for the kingdom ahead of us. Hey, that's grace. God's grace working in you. And by the way, God is more committed to that task than we are. God desires that for your life. As much as any of us would sit here to say, you know, I really want God to work in my life. And people come to pastors and say, Pastor, I just, want, I just don't know things. I just, I just want God to do something. I don't know what... Hey, God wants it more than you want it. Here's your verse to claim, believe, receive, walk, and stand on. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God's going to fulfill it completely one day, but he's in the process of bringing you to that place in your life right now. And sometimes it takes a long time for some of us, amen? But I praise God because he is a merciful God, that he is a patient God, and he has this intentional work that he's doing in me. If this issue of me becoming like Christ were left totally up to me, I would not get there, nor would you. It's like the song we shared in, in, you know, on Wednesday night about the, the man, Mr. Robinson, who wrote the song here, Lord, I'm prone to wander, you know, the old hymn. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for that courts of board. Why? Because, Lord, I'm prone to wander. So God in his grace is committed to us to make us like his son. That's step one. The second thing of this is, God, what is God's procedure for fulfilling His purpose, for making us like Christ Jesus? How does He plan to reverse this cycle of sin in my life, because I'm headed the wrong direction, turn me around, and begin to create in me a new heart and make me into His very image? How does He plan ultimately to, the bottom line, I guess the simplest term would be, make me godly, to make me like Christ, to make me like God? Where does that come from? Now, wouldn't you agree? That if every time you were confronted with a choice, and we're always, always confronted by lots of choices, that you just responded by listening to the Lord, hearing what He says, obeying Him from your heart, wouldn't you really believe it, in that kind of situation, if that's what you did in every situation, that you would become more like Christ? Am I right? But now I know what you're thinking. But that's impossible. In every situation. I've tried that. I just can't seem to find the desire. Or I can't find the power, then what do you need? What supplies you with the desire? What supplies you with the power to obey God in your life? 
It's grace. It's grace. God brings grace. You say, well, how do I get a hold of that grace in my own life? How do I experience that grace in my, my own life? Well, God described really only one primary way to receive grace. And the, the, the formula, if you want to put it that way, or the recipe or the process for that, you know, is, is found more than once, two, three times in Scripture. It's found over and over again. This principle is repeated. Where it says that God gives grace to the who? To the humble. God gives grace to the humble. It, it kind of starts like this. You know, you've got this where if responses come in our life, if, if I don't choose to do what God wants, I choose to do what I, what I want. And if I'm living my life like that, then I'm living in pride, all right? Pride is in my heart. Pride means I can do this, I can handle this, I'll do it. My, and a lot of people approach their Christian life like that. You know, they, they think that they can do it, they can handle it. That they can, that, that you watch God, you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm prove I love you, I'm going to show you I love you. But it's, we, we hit these responses in, in pride. Now, if I, if I choose to live by pride, guess what I'm not going to get? I'm not going to get grace. I'm not going to have that continuing passion, the desire, or the power to do God's will. And some of you are approaching your daily life, and although there's not this arrogance that you see on your part, there's still this, this I can do this mentality. I, I'll, I'll go to God when I need Him. <laughs> you need Him all the time. You know, I know I'll go to God when He gets rough. No, you, it's rough already. You just don't see it. The Bible says, Jesus said, for without me you can do nothing. So if I'm living with pride and the, and the issues come in my life, guess what? If there's no grace, there's no power, then that's going to lead always to disobedience. I might be able to hold on for a day or two of my own strength, but it won't last long. And now oh, disobedience leads us just to the opposite of what God desires for your life. And what does God desire to do? To make us godly. So we're not experiencing that, are we? Because the pride is in our heart and pride's in our life. So what do we need? Grace. God's procedure for making us like Christ, for working this way in our life, is always grace. And the pathway to godliness is obedience, all right? But God resists the proud, so he gives grace to the humble. So if I'm going to get to that point of godly, I, how do I get past that disobedience point? I've I got to humble myself first. I start with humility. You begin the day with humility. You begin each situation with humility, that God, you, you're in charge here. And I'm not going to preach this sermon again. We preach it on Wednesday night, but I want you to know the whole issue of humility gets down to you saying, I am absolutely aware of the fact that I can't deal with this by myself and I can't handle this life by myself. I need God. And I am going to lean everything upon Him and I'm going to trust in Him and I'm going to believe Him for whatever it is I'm facing in my life right now. And so we have the circumstances of life. We have the issues of life. We have the problems in life. So if I approach them in pride, it leads to disobedience, leads to ungodliness, because I have no power and our desire to do what God wants. And these things, they're always bombarding our life. Complex situations, complex people, complex trials, difficulties, recessions. I mean, just everywhere around us, there's things that, you know, should be hopefully introducing us to really how incapable we are without God, that we need the Lord. So what do we do? We humble ourselves before God. And then, guess what? Here comes grace. Just, just as I said, you know, that the response of pride leads to no grace, no power, no desire, leads to disobedience, ultimately to an ungodly life. Let's, let's start on the other side. I want to be godly. All right? That's, that's God's goal for my life. It, I need to embrace that goal for my life. If anything you could say about the Apostle Paul, this was the goal that he embraced for his life, to be like Christ, right? So therefore, if I need to be godly, there's going to have to be obedience in my life. Because at every turn of obedience, there's this shaping and this fashioning of making me more like Christ. But if I'm going to be obedient, I need something more than just me. I need grace. So what am I going to do at this point? Then I'm going to have to humble myself before God. And I'm really going to have to take hold of him and say, listen, I can't go further without you. I can't live this life without you. I know what I can do in my own strength, my own power. This is not working. And I'm going to get honest with you, and I'm going to embrace you fully and say, I need God in my life. So humility has to be a part of your Christian walk in life. And if there's no humility, if you still think you've got what it takes, then you've got a long road to hoe, and you're going to find some difficult paths and difficult journey in front of you to get you to the place. Because, folks, we can either humble ourselves or God can humble us. And let me say this. Humility is easier than humiliation. Amen. I would suggest that if you're serious about your walk with God, 
You get honest. You get that place where you talk about being transparent, being humble, and then being dependent upon God for what He wants to give you. That, this simple diagram just shows you that you see that the circumstances and the situation in your life, you can meet them in the grace of God. And you can have the power and the desire to do what's right in those situations. Only and by and through and because of the grace of God, you need the grace of God. It starts with honesty and humility, does it not? Let me see what the Apostle Paul, in fact, Apostle Paul is making a statement about here, all the difficulties in life, what it led to in his life was humility. He said, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, in other words, he's had all these tremendous visions and revelations and being caught up in the heavens by God, God has spoken to him. He said, there's a tendency here for exalting myself. So God says, let me give you a thorn in your flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment you. I said, great. Why? To keep me from exalting myself. And he said to me, my grace is... He said, I sought the Lord three times and implored him that he take this, that it, might leave, that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Say that with me. Power is perfected in weakness. Let's say it again. Power is perfected in weakness. So we make great candidates for God's power, don't we? If his power is perfected in weakness, and this is where Apostle Paul said, I have some problems. There's some issues. There's some thorns. There's some, and these things are the very things that bring me to the place to realize I really am dependent. So, hey, why should I gripe about these things? In fact, I'd rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. God says my power is sufficient for me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness and with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties. Let me say those again. Weaknesses, insults, distress, persecutions, difficulties. Anybody have any of those? How many have all five? <laughs> yes, we do, in a lot of different ways. And Paul's saying, listen, I'm content. He didn't say he's overjoyed, did he? But he said, I've accepted these things in my life because I'm going to approach them by the grace of God, and these are the very things that will show me that, I, that, I, that, that will literally nail me to the floor to get me to trust God. Hold, me to, hold my feet to the fire, so to say, that I'll believe God, because when I'm weak, then I am strong. And so much of the time, we resist that, don't we? We struggle with that. And by the way, he says, you know, this thorn, the word for thorn in the Greek language is not like a sliver or a splinter. All right? Literally described as a word to describe a tent stake, a big thing. Paul knew that the most extreme circumstances, in fact, the more extreme the circumstance was, the more he would realize his need, and the greater the need in realizing it, then the greater the demonstration of God's beautiful grace towards him. The greater he need for humility brought about a greater grace he received. So that the more these difficult situations came, and the more that he would realize he couldn't handle them, therefore he would humble himself, trust the Lord, that God would expose and minister his grace to his life so that he could be a conqueror, yea, in all things. Now this is God's pattern for all of our lives. We need to get to the point, just as the Apostle Paul was talking about in here in Philippians, where we really, you know, we embrace the purpose of God to make us like Christ. We realize that's what this is really all about. This life's really all about Jesus making me, working in me, changing me to make me acceptable in His sight and acceptable to Him godly. Yes, I'm accepted through the blood of Jesus, but He wants my life to be clean. He wants me to mature. He wants me to grow in grace. He wants me to demonstrate the life of God through my life. And so I, if I realize that this is my purpose, then my thinking begins to be changed, all right? And repentance becomes a, a, a way of living for me, of always turning, changing my thinking about situations and turning to God and discovering the grace of God. And as I do that, guess what? I'm discovering the greatest resource that God has for my life, His grace. Let me close with this. We're all familiar with John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace. Uh, you know, he was the former slave trader, and it's a great movie out. You can get it on Netflix about Amazing Grace. You know, he was saved by the grace of God from a terrible life. And he penned that great, most beloved hymn in all the world, just about, is Amazing Grace. Most people know the first and last verse, and they just sing it without any problem whatsoever. And that, but it's the middle verse, you kind of get this principle in action. He says, it was t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Now, that's the first application of grace. 
God begins to reveal. We see, we see a sense of the fear of God because now we realize we're sinners when we're separated from God. We know our need for Christ. We see the grace of God demonstrated at the cross of Christ. And we humble ourselves. And it's humbling to us to really get a full picture of Jesus dying for our sins. And we make that commitment, that hour of first belief. But he goes on in the same verse. He says, through many dangers. In other words, since then, through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. But it's grace that brought me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. It's where you're going to get there. I don't want to arrive in a mess. I want to arrive in grace. Amen. Amen. It's grace. Grace is the greatest need for our life. Now, that's not just Newton's testimony, but millions of humble believers, people who humble themselves at the grace of God and the mercies of God and received His grace. And here's the beautiful thing. If you study scriptures carefully, you see this grace is abundantly available for anyone who's willing to humble themselves, admit their need, depend upon God, and cry out to him. God says, I will give you what you need in that hour. His power, his desire. Now, there's situations that every one of us are facing, probably even today. You need grace. You need God's grace for that situation you're dealing with. And if not today, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow sometime. You'll be faced with a choice, perhaps, a temptation, a trial, a person, a conflict. You're going to need God's grace. But it's available. So why don't you quit wrestling with that thing in the strength of your own mind and your own might, trying to fashion it to your purposes, get it to work your way, humbly surrender it to God and say, Thy will be done. I need you. I can't make this thing work. I can't change a person. I can't change my own self. Only you can change me. I humbly need your grace. That's the way we get saved. That's the way we come to Christ. We humble ourselves and we receive the grace of God. Nobody gets saved without the grace of God. And nobody gets saved without and gets the grace of God without humbling themselves, repenting, yielding their heart and their life to Christ. And there are issues we face every day where we have to just come and do that. Say, God, this is this is this is something that's it's like a nail and it's like a thorn, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. I realize I need you and receive the grace of God. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, grace my fears relieved. Hallelujah for that. But what about the dangers and the toils and the snares that we have to go through and we have to deal with? Well, it's grace that will bring you through all those. It's grace that will deliver you home. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, your grace is marvelous.